Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another webinar with Interfaith Explorers. My name is Claire Clinton, and I'm an RE advisory teacher down in the East End of London, where, as I look out the window, the weather is sunny today. Um, I'm not sure where you are in the country or even the world, but I hope the sun is shining on you as well. So you're very welcome today. Our webinar this uh, month is on the role of um, uh, fundamental British values in schools and community cohesion and uh, we've picked up on that because we were looking at safeguarding in our last webinar and uh, we wanted to continue that flow and just to think a little bit more about some of the things that Ofsted is requiring from schools at the moment in Britain and to think about um, the benefits of considering these things and how to implement them in our schools. So welcome if you've been to some of our webinars before. Uh, if you haven't, just to say, um, where you can see me below there, there will be a PowerPoint presentation that you can open up so you can uh, look at that uh, rather than looking at me if you would prefer. I know that some of you uh, print that off and uh, have that to make notes on as we go through the webinar. You'll also notice that underneath there is a place where you can put in your comments and any questions. And we like to leave the, the last 10 minutes or so of our time so that we can answer those for you today. So if you have got a question or a point or something you want clarified as I'm talking through, then please do send those in. Um, I have a beautiful assistant who is out of sight uh, who uh, will pass those to me at appropriate points. So please do see this as an uh, interactive way of us looking at this theme and talking about it today. So um, on our session objectives, we've said that we've wanted to do four things today. To have a look and to consider the Ofsted expectations around promoting fundamental British values uh, and their role in schools. Um, to look at those British values have been defined by Ofsted. They're, obviously, if we were talking about values and if we were talking about what are fundamental British values, uh, we could have maybe a similar list, maybe a very different list to the one that we as schools have been given by Ofsted. But obviously, that's the one that we need to work on and work with in terms of inspection process and in terms of expectations. So we want to look at the role of those within the school, but also how they flow into and relate to uh, SMSC, which is social, moral, cultural, um, and uh, sorry, what have I left out? Spiritual, the first one, spiritual education. Uh, thirdly, we want to provide you um, some ideas for best classroom practice around fundamental British values, and also to consider some safeguarding issues that flow out from them. So there you go, that's what we're going to look at this afternoon. So um, you'll see the next slide down um, gives a definition from Ofsted about what they're looking for. And I'm just going to read a little bit of that to you. Um, it's just off to the side here. So I'm just going to look this way a little bit. But it says, um, when uh, inspectors come into a school, they're looking for how pupils show acceptance and engagement with fundamental British values of democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, mutual respect and tolerance of those with different faiths and beliefs. The pupils develop and demonstrate skills and attitudes that, that will allow them to participate fully in and contribute positively to life in modern Britain. So often when we bring this uh, topic up with staff, we need to start with the fact that I think there is a real positive in the midst of this. This um, need to show how we're looking at fundamental British values has a positive thing in the centre of it, which is about enabling pupils, uh, whatever their background, whatever their culture, uh, whatever their social standing is, to be able to participate in and contribute to modern life in modern Britain. And I think many of us became teachers because we want children to uh, realise their potential. And anything that helps me as a teacher put the pupils in the centre and think, what do they need to be able to be their best and to grow into the people that they could be? 
How can they realize that? Then I find that really motivating as a teacher. And so I think in the midst of lots of controversy around these values, I think there is something really important and really helpful, which is about we're wanting to grow and nurture children um, to be adults who can take responsible action, who can make thoughtful decisions, um, who can mix and uh, mix with all sorts of people have a broad understanding of the world, actually understand what is special about our country, uh, why we choose to live here and rather than being somewhere else, and also how we can make a contribution to future society. So I think that's really important. One of the things that I've found um, when you're bringing these values up, these fundamental British values as defined by Ofsted with staff, is it's really important to actually define what some of these things are. Um, and uh, if you're interested, there's an activity that I've got, um, which very simply, as you'll see on the next slide, has some pictures of these five values and uh, then has some definitions that go with these things. And a very simple sorting activity uh, can help lots of teachers just put their mind at rest about what these things are about. These are not things that we're not already doing in our schools. So most of our schools are democratic places to a certain extent, as is our country. So often there are school council, we have elections um, within our schools. If we're looking at our teaching staff, you know, which teachers sit on governors, the elections that place them on there, um, that we have elements of democracy within our school systems. And a democratic state is one where it gives equal rights and privileges to every member of that state. And so our country, along with a lot of other countries, fit into being a democratic place where people can have a voice. I know many schools this year, uh, particularly where I work in Newham, have uh, brought in a new part to school council by having a head boy and a head girl. I know secondary schools have done this for a long time, but in primary schools that hasn't always been common practice. And I think this year with it being an election year, we're only a few weeks off now from our general election. I think many teachers found that was a really useful way for children to be able to understand what was happening in society around them. Uh, because these elections only come once every five years, um, it was a point at which maybe to educate them about the systems we have in Britain. Uh, we're really fortunate uh, here, and you may be, by having children who come from different places in the world, uh, whose families maybe have come second or third generation uh, from somewhere else in the world. And those children can really add um, a sense of how special Britain is, um, because they may know about how there are other systems. Obviously, we have one type of democracy. We don't have proportional representation um, as our form of democracy. So um, I suppose for me, democracy isn't really a value, but there are some values embedded within democracy. I think democracy is a political system uh, or a social system of decision making, and our country uses one form of democratic system but I do think there are some values within there and I think that sorting activity it's important for staff to be able to understand that or be able to articulate it they won't need to understand it it's more it helps you sometimes to have a voice into these things particularly when someone's placing a value on you and saying right it's really important you do this to have that moment to be able to reflect and think actually we're already doing this we educate children around these things um, and actually maybe that's not a value maybe that's a system but there are some good values in there and our school is going to promote those in a certain way we've also got rule of law and as you'll be very aware. Schools have many laws and many systems of rewards and punishments. Again, why do we do that? We do that to try and get the best out of our children. We want them to grow up and be well-rounded and to be able to fit into wider society. And so again, that's something that we're doing um, within our school systems anyway. Um, I think rule of law is also about sort of judiciary um, in terms of Britain being separate from government. 
Um, and when we find out that things have not been fair, I think there is always a reaction within our society that that's not good enough, that there are ways that things should happen. And um, we have judges and high court judges and all sorts of people who can look and review on certain situations. And punishments exist for those who break the law. And it's not only about children knowing about those punishments, it's also understanding the rule of law is about the benefits of a society working together, of being cohesive. And what we can achieve together is so much more than we can achieve on our own. And there's something very special in there as a value of the individual, but also a value of people working together that I think also comes under that rule of law. We also have individual liberty and um, I think individual liberty really helps us to present all sorts of controversial issues, particularly in secondary schools, uh, maybe um, around something like abortion. I'm thinking in my own uh, terms of teaching and subjects that come up at the GCSE, that we have rule of law on these things and that rule of law is based upon individual liberties. Uh, that every citizen of our country has. And so there is a right to exercise your individual liberty. So we have freedom of speech. Um, that doesn't always exist in every country. We, again, we're not saying that individual liberty is a, a, is a British value um, only, but it is a value that we adhere to in Britain. Um, and there are safeguards in place, aren't there, that protect our individual liberties. So there are places we can go, people we can speak to, where they are broken, uh, recourse that we can go through. And again, for young people to understand that, the benefits and the responsibilities, as well as the privileges of British society is important. Now that's not saying that those are different from French society. I think many of them will be the same. Uh, or a society in Africa or Asia or Latin America. We're not saying these fundamental British values are only British values. I think what Ofsted is trying to say is here are some values that are very important to us here in Britain. Obviously they come from universal understanding and universal rights, um, but they are embedded within our laws, within how we act within our country. And the last two, which um, really excite me because they much more come for me into my subject area, which is RE, is tolerance and mutual respect. And um, Helen Keller, a uh, very famous um, person who did lots of work, uh, charitable work, um, oh, 100 years or so ago now, I'm sure someone will correct me with her precise dates. But anyway, um, she said one of the uh, highest uh, forms of education is tolerance and what she meant by that was when children young people can disagree agreeably and that really goes to the heart of interfaith explorers and the reason for doing this interfaith dialogue and for children to learn about difference and diversity and to celebrate that is is that ability to be able to disagree but to do it in an agreeable way to understand the bigger picture uh, to understand what every individual can contribute, as well as being able to respect those differences and to live alongside them. And you do need to be tolerant to be able to do that. And as we know, as we look around the world, not every person would agree with that. Some people do believe the way that they want the world to be run is the only way that it can be run and will um, push people out of the way or even remove people. Um, that if they don't agree with their viewpoints. So there is something different about, I suppose, Western thinking. There's something different in British thinking around all of those things. And so Ofsted is asking us to investigate those things. Um, I really am a great fan of getting children to do their own thinking um, and uh, to bring these things up and to work through with them uh, their thoughts and their ideas because I find in any classroom uh, where there are over sort of 20 children you'll have different viewpoints very naturally and that gives you enough to be able to work from and to think about these things. So if you go on to the next slide, you'll see the other things that Ofsted say to their inspectors at the moment around these fundamental British values is it's really important that um, the curriculum that children are being taught is broad and balanced. 
And again, that they're not expecting to see a narrowness in the curriculum. And I think in, in our state schools, uh, that's very much the case because we have to follow certain things given to us by governments. Um, our RE syllabus um, presented by SACRACE through an agreed syllabus is always broad and balanced. Um, I think if your school is an academy or a free school, it's really important that you double check, you know, which agreed syllabus have you adopted? Uh, what are you using to ensure that your RE and other parts of your curriculum are broad and balanced? Where you have that greater freedom to choose, it's really important that we make positive choices to ensure that uh, we're not um, saying girls can do one thing and boys another, but we have equal opportunities in our schools. So what are inspectors looking for? They're looking for a school that's actively uh, celebrating or promoting these values. And I said, that's very easy to do and you'll be doing it already within your school, I'm sure. That we're promoting tolerance, so respect for all. And that could be people's faith, it could be their race, it could be their gender, it could be age, it could be disability or sexual orientation. That all of these things are tolerated within our schools. And the other thing that they talk about is a well-rounded um, program of assemblies. This time where we bring the school together is really important and it's very key for SMSC, for our spiritual, moral, social, cultural development of pupils. Because when the school comes together and there's an agreement made, that's much more powerful than one teacher in one classroom saying something. Uh, when everybody is gathered and some information or a value is celebrated or investigated. So these daily acts of assembly and the, having this point of being able to reflect and for the pupils themselves to be able to reflect on the things that uh, teachers or staff or pupils are telling them about is really important. And I would say at the moment, it's really important for your school to make sure that these fundamental British values uh, are coming up at different points through your programme of assemblies. And I'm sure that's already the case. So any final judgments that Ofsted are making will look about um, the provision and the effectiveness and impact of the spiritual, moral, social, cultural education. And that's where these fundamental British values flow out from. So we need to make sure that we're knowing how SMSC is impacting pupils. So we need to make sure that we find bits of evidence that show something that we've done and the impact that it's had, the change that it's brought around or the challenge that it's brought. We can't always change people's ideas and people's thinking, but we can challenge where we do it. And that's important. And obviously, we want children to be able to think for themselves, to weigh up different points of view, and to respectfully disagree with others. That's important. So, how do you go about this in your school? Well, one of the things I've been saying to schools here that they need to do is an audit on their fundamental British values. So, uh, whether you do that with a number of teachers or with your whole staff, what can you celebrate from these five things that you're doing already? Maybe it's something around school council. Maybe it's something that the children have suggested that that's been thought through and taken up and that has made a change in the school great bit of impact evidence that you can give there of something that you can celebrate around these things. But are there things that maybe um, that you do, but you haven't got the impact evidence for yet? So they're quick wins, something you can turn around. Um, you just need to talk to somebody or you need to record something. And actually then there's another thing that you can celebrate. But actually, when we do an audit, when we think through how we're we doing on fundamental British values, sometimes we find there are certain things that maybe we're not doing. Maybe they've fallen between subjects or maybe they've fallen um, just so we've not thought about them. And through doing the audit, that comes back to us. And therefore, we can say, OK, there's a challenge. How are we going to over the next year or two years? How are we going to embed this into our school? So um, how effectively are we promoting fundamental British values? Uh, and as I say, you want to look through things, look for your evidence, 
think about, okay, is there anything we could be doing better? And from doing that audit, you'll find there is a big question that your school might want to focus on. On the next PowerPoint slide, I mentioned three potential ones. Obviously, there are others, but I hope that helps you uh, to, to start thinking about what your big question is. So it's, it's getting to the root of why are we doing these things? What are they actually there for? So it could be um, something about the values in your school. It could be something about school improvement, or it could be something around well-being and the well-being of our students. And so actually we want to look at these things because we want to build up uh, their well-being. And some of that is about their resilience, some of that is about their self-esteem, some of that is about knowledge of wider communities and where they fit in. And you can't do all of those questions, I would suggest. I would just suggest focusing on one. Uh, and when you've done that, it's really important that you then have those discussions with different stakeholders. So it may be going and thinking that through with your school council. It may be at the staff meeting. It may be with your governors. It may be you have a parent association. Uh, it may be that you have certain parents that come into school and help you with reading or run clubs. So you want to think about who your stakeholders are in your school and you want to um, have a time with talking to them about some of these values and what, how they feel they're seen in the school or where they're not or where their concerns are. And that would then allow you to go on to doing uh, a SWOT analysis, which looks at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats of these fundamental British values in our particular school. So this really grounds uh, the big question that you're asking, the audit you've done, into what could change. So a threat is something that perhaps if there wasn't somebody within the senior leadership team that this role was given to, that could be a threat um, because then there may not be somebody who focuses on this. What opportunities are there? Are there challenges or weaknesses that we need to think about? And what are our strengths? What are the things that we can celebrate? And remember, in terms of Ofsted, we want to have the impact evidence for our strengths. They don't want a shopping list. Um, I'm sorry if I'm teaching you to suck eggs, but they don't want a shopping list. They just want a few things with good evidence, um, impact evidence for pupils, the difference it makes. That's important. I think another question that's really important at the centre of here is what does it mean to be British? And I have been uh, using philosophy for children over this last term, leading uh, a number of inquiries in uh, primary and secondary schools here um, in my surrounding area. And it's been really interesting um, for me to listen to what some of the children have said. Uh, what's great about Great Britain is a great opening sentence. Um, interesting, again, the things they've said, free elections have come up. Uh, being able to see a doctor or a dentist free NHS. Also free education. Um, I did do a little bit of education around that to say there is no free education. Every place at a school costs. Um, and I think uh, the overall figure for a, a school place uh, in this country sits between uh, seven and eight thousand pounds for each pupil. And so I was explaining to them about how I pass over a quarter of my salary each month to the government and how they choose to do things with that. And one of the things is free education. And uh, the children were quite passionate about education, which was lovely for me to experience in the classroom and for them to say that's one of the things that is great about our country, that all children can come to school and can have an education. Obviously, they can be homeschooled and uh, as well, that's another option that we have. But education is central for each pupil. So when I was talking about what it means to be British, it was interesting to see how some of the children really understood that they were British, but maybe they also had another identity. So it may be that, um, that their family one or two generations ago came from another country. It was very interesting when I've talked to teachers to find out about some of the countries where uh, Britain 
uh, had a colony at one point and then when independence came that people within there were given the chance of would they like a British passport or would they like their country's passport um, and uh, one teacher I was talking to she was saying her parents kept her home country passport but they opted for all their children to have a British passport because they felt that in the future that might be useful. And uh, she was reflecting on the fact that actually her and her brothers and sisters uh, all left that country and came here for their education because they then could do because of that passport. So are you only British if you have a British passport? Can you live here without the passport and be British? How long would you have to live here uh, to uh, be British? These are all questions that need unpicking. And obviously, um, as we think about what is British, I was uh, talking about this with some year fours this week, and we were using a concept line uh, and thinking about what was more British and less British. So, uh, for instance, they had the Queen. Was she more British or less British? Because one of their other pictures was Nelson Mandela. Uh, we had a red squirrel. We had the BBC and the children had to justify where they would put it on the line of more British, less British. And at the end of that activity, I asked them what they'd learnt. And they said, well, we've learnt that what we think is British is a bit different for each of us, but also that a lot of things that are British originally came from other countries. So, for instance, our most popular school um, food in Britain is curry. Um, now, our curries are slightly different, uh, maybe from Indian curries. Um, there's been gravy added to Indian curries and we've created a new thing. And again, one of the teachers was saying to me this week about how uh, chicken tikka masala, which I think is our most popular dish, um, has now been taken back out to India <laughs> as a British dish, uh, not as an Indian dish. So it's very interesting, isn't it, how cultures learn from one another, grow from one another, but also change around one another. And I think it is important that children have this time to think about what is British and what isn't. And isn't it terrible if some children are in our schools, they've been born here, they're being brought up here, and yet they don't feel they're British. I think it's really important for them to understand they can have more than one identity in terms of nationality, but also that people here in Britain would think of them as British. We don't want to see them as outside, but rather inside. So the final thing I want to talk to you a little bit about today is safeguarding, because I think around fundamental British values, there's some really important things for us to think through as schools on safeguarding. You see, we need to think about who's coming into our schools and who we're placing in a role of that teacher, uh, which is one that we teach children to listen to and to accept. And so it's really important that we're making sure our visitors and our other people who come into school understand our school values and are happy to do their work within the school, whether it's voluntary or paid, underneath that. As teachers, we have professional, um, our professional standards that we work to. And I think that's really important that also other people that are in that place of being a teacher understand those so they understand using open language maybe around their own beliefs and not saying things so categorically and actually if we see something we're not happy about do all our staff know our protocols for what we do who we speak to and how we resolve those situations we want pupils who are able uh, not in a rude way, but to be able to question and think about what they're being told, not just to swallow it whole. And what you'll see on the next couple of slides is a couple of case studies that have happened um, in schools around me over this last year. And I've put them on there for you just to be able to think, what would you do in your school if this was the situation? And just to say some really important points from them. Uh, one, it's really important to know where to go for help and who to go to. So it's really important within our staff training in safeguarding that they know what to do if a situation like case study one comes up. What do you do and where do you go? Also, these situations are all fairly easy to um, sort 
uh, for the children as well as for the adults involved. And sometimes adults can say things, whether they're religious things or not, very, very definitely, that aren't actually very definite within a religion. And that's why having someone like me, an RE advisor, a SACRE that every school in the country's got that you can go to would be really, really helpful. Okay, so um, case study one just mentioned there was 20 pupils in year five um, who, across three separate classes, told teachers that they can no longer do art activities. It's against their religion. And uh, the teacher had to think very quickly, uh, okay, what do we do? And I think all those three teachers sort of gave an alternative activity for those boys on that afternoon. But obviously, at the end of school, they talked to one another and found out that there were different boys across different classes. And what had happened in that situation was that, um, that somebody had, um, in particular, had uh, said something to the children, not fully understanding something from their own religion. And uh, what that meant was that the, the children uh, had picked up something wrongly and interpreted it wrongly. And that had made a big change to things. So um, it was easy to sort out. But sometimes we can be told things by parents and grandparents, and that can change over time. And this is what had happened in this. In fact, in this particular religion, there wasn't a problem with them doing art. Um, and uh, I got involved, some faith leaders got involved, there was a bit of re-education for the person who'd said it in the first place, so they were able to go back and put that right with the children. In the second case study, we've got teachers who are telling you that one of the regular visitors in your school who leads collective worship has very strong religious views and doesn't really seem to understand the diversity of all the children that they're speaking to. And what do you do next? Well, in this particular school, uh, we got all the visitors in um, and uh, we did some training on uh, open language and helped those visitors to understand the context they were working in. And I think they were really grateful for that. Obviously, people who come into schools are trying to be helpful, are trying to make a contribution. They're trying to build up links between schools and, and community. But sometimes they're not trained teachers, they don't understand a school context, and they need our support to help them through that. So what's best practice then in terms of fundamental British values? Well, we want to educate our pupils to be part of modern British life, yes. To nurture critical thinking is really important. So for instance, in case study one, key question there is why the children didn't ask the person who told them this stuff about art, where does it say that in our holy book? They didn't ask any critical questions. And that's the safeguarding issue, that if we bring up children who just swallow things whole without thinking about it and asking, that isn't, I think, what any teacher would want ultimately. We don't want robots. We actually want individuals who can think for themselves. We want pupils who can embrace and be part of wider communities, whether that's ethnically, culturally, religiously, that they can mix well with different people. And as I've said before, that they can agree, disagree or disagree agreeably with other people. So we've got a few questions in and it's time to go to those. So please keep sending them in if you have any. So um, how do or can teachers define fundamental British values for young age pupil groups? Um, yeah, and I think this is a really good question because concepts and big things are quite hard to understand. Um, and I think democracy and rule of law, particularly if you can use the school council elections, uh, often each classroom has ways of acting whether we're talking about primary or secondary, an agreed way that we work together. And individual liberty often comes into that as well. So if we can use something from their lives, that's really, really helpful. That helps them to, to, to see, uh, to work through that metaphor in a sense, to see how that idea, that concept is a reality. And I think younger children do need realities. 
I think it's simple things sometimes when children answer questions and we're able to say back to them, particularly in reception, young children, okay, that's what you believe. And, oh, look, over here, uh, James believes something else. James, can you remind us, what did you say? What do you think? What do you do? And actually, we can model that difference, that there can be different answers, and all those answers are absolutely fine. We're not actually into right and wrong. We're looking at the difference that we have between us. So um, I think rule of law is not too bad because there are so many rules in every school that kids do understand that there's ways of doing things and ways that we shouldn't do things. And if we don't do things right, we can have punishments. There can be problems. Uh, we can lose stars or uh, we can lose rewards. But also in our schools, we have lots of positive rewards and also talk about those because actually we're following the rules. Okay, another question. How do you deal with a pupil who says they can't mix with people from other backgrounds? Yeah, and I think, you know, um, we don't want to make the pupil feel bad, but we also want to move them on. Um, and actually, sometimes it's important that we go back to parents when this comes up and just say, you know, obviously we understand that you wouldn't be saying that your child shouldn't mix with other children from different backgrounds, that one of the things that is the most exciting about where we live or where we are is the fact that we can learn about how different families do things in different ways. Um, and uh, that approach can often then give a signal to a parent and in front of the child to say, actually, no, that is fine. Um, sometimes you need to handle that very carefully. Um, if you're worried about the parent's reaction, obviously you have that conversation first with just you and the parent. When you get them to a point of accepting that this is good for their child, to be able to fit into the world, to fit into a diverse situation, a diverse society, that opportunity of having friendships with different people and understanding different people only benefits their child, makes their child more likely to get work, more likely to be happy as an adult in the work that they do if they can mix with others. And also, there's not a fear. I suppose sometimes we've got to look at what the fear is from the home, uh, if there is one, about what they're worried about with their children mixing. I know that they can sometimes, children can very naturally group around uh, people who are very similar to themselves. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that in itself. But it's making sure as a classroom that we are cohesive, that actually we can mix and do things differently. Our next question, how do you explain to young children uh, about some of the limits to some of our rights and liberties and free speech? Oh, this is a good question. Uh, yes that we have free speech, but there's certain times when we can use it, and there's certain ways of saying. So um, that is all about understanding politeness, isn't it? And again, that's not really a British concept. Um, it's about how to get our views over in the right and the best way. And I think that is, it's, it's very painstakingly, because it happens day after day after day, of younger children learning the do's and don'ts of how to express themselves. I don't think we always have to um, publicly tell someone off when they've got something wrong because you know as the teacher children's hearts and sometimes privately just having a word and saying you know when you said that that wasn't the right way of saying that um, when you want to say something like that this is how I would say it and actually that that makes everyone feel okay because I know you wouldn't want to make other people feel bad when you say something um, and I suppose within our school days we have times when children can say their points of view and we have times where we have to get on and I suppose through working that through with them they'll understand that there are limits as we've said sometimes to our rights and our individual liberties particularly when they um, butt up to someone else's so just because I have a religious Thing I want to do it doesn't mean always that I can do it, um, particularly if I'm employed or particularly if I'm at a certain place. So those things um, you need to work through with individuals to understand there are times and places uh, that are important. Okay, the final question we've got in here 
is as a teacher, I sometimes struggle with pupils who don't know how to, um, sorry, don't know how to agreeably disagree. It leads to other children in my class becoming upset. Um, how do I deal with such kids? Well, I was doing it today in a school um, and I was saying to a girl who was upset, okay, do you know what? Those children said the wrong thing to you and those children can hear me saying this to uh, the girl and um, actually in a moment they're going to apologize for that because as they think about it they're going to think we expressed that the wrong way what they were trying to do is they were trying to get on with the tasks that I set and because you were holding on to those cards um, they were a bit frustrated but actually they did it the wrong way anyway I'll come back in a bit and I'm sure it'll all be sorted and off I go and when I came back I said to her did the boys apologize to you now one of the boys did and one of the boys didn't and so then I spoke to the boy who didn't at the side and I said, why did you not do the thing that I was showing you was the right thing to do? And he said, well, I didn't feel like it. I didn't want to. And so we reflected on what if I only did the things I wanted to? What would the classroom be like if it was always the way I wanted it? And I never gave thought to how he felt. Now, he didn't like that idea. And I said, well, you know, that's what you were doing to the girl. You were saying what I think is the most important and the way I want to do it is the most important. And actually, that's not a way to lead a happy classroom because are you going to get the best out of her? No, he knew he wasn't. She'd been upset. Did it make you feel good that you've upset somebody? Actually, no, it didn't really. He went back over. He apologised and it was fine. So I think you can model and teachers do all the time the best and and take the children that are struggling to one side and and just show them what the world would be like if we followed through on the things they were saying they often don't want a world like that they actually do like the fact that they matter and uh, people care about them okay um last question now question five just had another one in what happens if there's a disagreement a senior management team or governor's level uh, about definitions of British values. Well, I think this is why it's quite helpful um, that these fundamental British values have been defined for us um, and that we can look uh, to these five particular values. They aren't, as I've already mentioned, I think all values. I think rule of law and um, democracy is uh, a, a system. I don't think it's a value, but within those there are some values. And yes, we are going to, as a school, come to a collective idea of what's important to us at this point. And that is ever changing and working out. And some of those disagreements happen because we're, we're pushing and we're working things through. And that's fine. There's not a problem with that. But what I would say is Ofsted have defined these values for us. And these are the ones that they're coming to inspect us on so it's really important that actually we lead through on these ones and make sure that these ones are being covered um, and as I say we'll put this definition list up on the website uh, that I've been referring to in the webinar and uh, you can have a look at that and see um, if that is helpful for you okay our time has come to the end now so uh, thank you very much for staying with us and listening. I hope you found that helpful. A uh, quick look through these fundamental British values. I hope there's some practical things that your school can take away and do from this. As I say, we'll put a couple of things on the website um, around the definitions uh, that I hope you'll find helpful if you want to do that activity with your staff. And uh, we'll see you uh, next month. Uh, when we're going to be looking at another topic um, and hopefully helping you as teachers to build up your confidence as well as uh, your practice within your school to handle difference and handle interface discussions well. So thank you very much for your time and do send in if you have any more questions or thoughts. We can. Uh,